speaker, Andre, for sharing your work with us today. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Andre. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Definitely interrupt. Um, we've actually got someone who knows something about penguins here. So that's a good sign because I don't really know much about penguins. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about is a little different than I guess every quantitative seminar I've done for the last 25 years or something at this point. So this is really a summary of a panel that I had the misfortune or fortune of chairing. Um, um, and uh, uh, why I thought it'd be useful to, to give this presentation was really, it gives you an idea of how science and um, policy and uh, people sort of interact uh, in, in a situation where we have everything from um, extremely poor people who depend on fisheries to a little bit of cultural imperialism, uh, including from this university, um, on who, what, what a uh, country like South Africa should be doing to conserve its resources. Um, uh, actually, it was interesting listening to um, to Chris yesterday afternoon about what is success in fisheries management. Because um, as I touch on some of the fishery sides of things here, this is this the fishery that I'll be talking about is considered to be, uh, if not one of the best managed small pelagic fisheries in the world certainly a world leader in things like terms you might have heard of like management strategy evaluation the very first management strategy evaluation was applied in in this fishery so from a sustainability point of view this is a success and listening to um uh chris yesterday um we'll see how what kind of grade we get for some of the other things so this is a this is definitely a summary of uh work that i did not do um, the, the panel that I'll talk about as we go through uh, consisted of uh, six uh, individuals, uh, myself, Bob Burness, who is a seabird ecologist based in Scotland, uh, Anna Palmer, you should all know who Anna is because she's a uh, alum from the school and will be giving a keynote at the World Fisheries Congress, uh, as well as winning the main award from the Congress. Uh, Eva Pagani, who is an old friend of mine, also from the University of Cape Town. Uh, Jim Sanricchio, who is an economist. Uh, Jim actually failed the economics test for this because uh, this particular panel was flown to South Africa. Uh, we had a wonderful week there. Jim, unfortunately, had to teach. Uh, so he, at, you, you'd think the economist would be the one who'd be flying business class to South Africa. Instead, he was getting up at two o'clock in the morning and got contributing to our panel. So he is an economist, but that's why we put him on the corner there. Um, Phil Trapham is a penguin uh, ecologist. Uh, most of his work has been done in the Antarctic. Um, all of us are involved to some extent in, in fisheries management. Uh, I was asked to chair this panel, um, I believe, because I could tell Doug Butterworth to shut up. Uh, <laughs> my, only, my only qualification for chairing this panel is I can be a bit obnoxious, and this was a pretty, this was an obnoxious crowd. Um, but we had a, a really good team of, of people. So um, let's talk a little bit about what, where, how we got to where we got. So I'll be talking about the African penguin. There'll be lots of pictures. I took none of them. Uh, but you'll get to see little penguins. They're very cute in their own way. Um, the, the population uh, was estimated to be in the millions originally. Um, obviously, things have uh, uh, impacted uh, particularly habitat for penguins for, for centuries. Population, uh, in terms of pairs, which is the statistic we tend to use, um, uh, back in the 1980s, about 10,000 pairs. There was a beautiful increase, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, up to about 30,000. And uh, this population essentially has been declining uniformly uh, over time. There are um, six main, I think it's six main uh, breeding areas. There are a couple of areas that have one or two penguins, but we didn't care about them. Uh, I will talk about, uh, I'll refer to quite a number of these areas. Um, so hopefully you'll remember where they are. So here's Cape Town, University of Cape Town being here in, in Cape Town. Well, <laughs> Cape Town is sort of the wrong place, but anyway, it should be about there. Um, so the, the, the co colonies I'm going to refer to are Dusson Island, um, uh, just north of, well, fairly far north of, of Cape Town. Uh, Robin Island, which you should all have heard of because that's where Nelson Mandela spent uh, whatever, 35 years. So it's a 
the, the shaded area are closed areas. Um, I'm not going to talk about that for the moment. Then we've got two, uh, this is now on the south coast, uh, only uh, Renelle can pronounce the name of that. That thing. <laughs> um, I won't refer to I can't pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've got St. Croix Island. Uh, we've got Bird Island. So this is uh, uh, towards towards the, the east here of uh, South Africa. Then we've got two other uh, colonies, one of which actually isn't an island, uh, Stony Point and then Dyer Island. And then um, there is a colony uh, in uh, a place called Boulders, which is uh, actually a part of a suburb of Cape Town. Uh, and it is what is number two tourist attraction off the Kruger Park or something. You know, I, I really don't see that myself. But anyway, so you know, you, you've seen you've you've, eat, you've seen and eaten the big five. Once you've done that, you've got to go see the penguins. Um, and in fact, that is a significant uh, resource to to the city of Cape Town. But of course, from a conservation point of view, it's the decline that we've we've seen here. So um, the nice thing about uh, declines is they attract a lot of attention by all and sundry. Um, and there have been a lot of different hypotheses about what has caused this decline. So they, they, essentially, as far as I can work out, there is not a single piece of good news for this population. Everything we know about it tends to be negative. Um, much attention has been focused on uh, fishery related effects. And that's what this panel really focused on. But we, we talked about other things as well. Um, so there's two essential ways that prey can affect uh, predator uh, uh, dynamics. Most of the focus has been on reproductive dynamics because they're, they're much easier to measure than things like survival and stuff. Uh, but the issues uh, that have been raised are just simple. We just don't have enough prey. These things tend to eat small pelagic fishes, uh, particularly during the reproductive phase. Um, so just not enough prey, uh, prey being disturbed uh, by fishing. Fishing uh, in this region is that, that I'm focusing on are these pelagic persanes, uh, uh, which will obviously disrupt a, a school. Um, and then there is a more, there's a slightly more subtle um, effect going on. Uh, people tend to think uh, that, you know, you've got an island colony and then you've got prey around the colony and you fish the prey out, right? That's the wrong, that's not what's going on here. Um, the dynamics of the species we're talking about, they tend to um, spawn down here. The larvae are advected up the west coast, and then the uh, age zeros in particular uh, migrate down. So we call this the river model. So basically, if, if, if Bill is a fisherman and he fishes uh, the animals out of Dusson Island, the, Penguins he's affecting are probably the penguins over here, not the penguins <laughs> where he is fishing. So there is a sort of a subtlety here that's not just local fishing that we're concerned about, but it's what we call fishing the river, basically disrupting what's coming uh, down to be to be to be fed on. Now there are a number of other things that are going on here. Um, uh, I'll touch some of the ones down here. Um, uh, Previously, and Renell's the, the expert, um, the, the islands that these penguins were operating on were harvested, was it the 19th century for guano mainly? It stopped in about 1980. Uh, so seabird guano provided habitat for the, the nests. Those were, you know, the, the, the guano harvesting sort of dealt with that fairly successfully. Um, and at least until recently, when nest boxes were brought in, this impacted the sort of quality of the, the nesting location. Um, so cage fighting for penguins, not a thing, because penguins lose, right? <laughs> um, and it turns out that there are several um, uh, predators that are potentially uh, to blame for some of the changes in abundance. Uh, Cape fur seals are, are the sort of prime suspects. And in fact, that we just heard that they wiped out was it 50 pairs in St. Croix or something like that. There was a newspaper article that just saw yeah, about a week ago. Um, so Cape fur seals, you've got a, how big is a Cape fur seal? A couple of hundred yeah. kilos? Yeah, same as what you see with most of the seals here. So penguin fur seal. Not a condoms. Um, And not only do they disrupt them, they actually eat them. Um, and the other thing about Cape fur seals, like most fur seals, is when we hear 
uh, Terence's uh, presentation on his pinniped ana analysis is pretty much every pinniped is increasing, and that's also true of Cape fur seal. So they were harvested virtually to extinction back in the as, as late as the 1930s, but have been recovering very much. So there's this nice inverse relationship. Um, pollution, oil pollution, there's been some fairly large spills. Um, shipping noise. Um, so South Africa decided to put its largest bunkering operation uh, right there. Um, and uh, the, there's some recent work that suggests, and again, it's not an experiment in any sense, but uh, since they put the bunkering in there, the animals at that Cyan Croy Island seem to have vanished. So the penguins don't like to hear the sound of ships. Uh, the problem is you can't really fly ships. You have to put them in the ocean somewhere. So there's some, there's, you're starting to see the trade-offs we're talking about here. And of course, everyone's favorite is climate change. Uh, this is a plot from a, a fairly, now fairly classic paper by Will Robertson, uh, University of Cape Town, uh, where for the, uh, it was Dutton Island, uh, they plotted the adult, some estimated adult survival rate against sardine biomass, and you get this sort of classic uh, threshold uh, where this is natural mortality, so you don't want one, a, a big one is bad, right? Um, so people keep thinking this is survival. It's not survival, it's natural mortality. So uh, essentially, once you drop below some threshold, uh, basically the sardine, um, the, the sardine related, uh, sorry, the, the, net, the adult mortality seems to increase. Um, and uh, essentially these populations aren't sustainable unless you've got a survival rate of about 70%. You're not producing a 70% survival rate. You just can't, they can't churn out enough um, uh, re uh, young to, to reproduce. So anything below this is basically an unsustainable population. So um, there, are, there are a few things we know about. The other context, and this is a question. Yeah. Do, do they occupy those areas year round? No, well, it, 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 we're really focusing on the, the, the breeding colonies. They're at sea for, um, once the chicks fledge, they're, they're pretty much out of there. They have to come onto islands to, to molt and stuff like that, but the focus has really been on the the breeding the breeding cycle. But this is pelagic phase too. Oh, the, 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 uh, well, they take they come to islands and they, they use the colonies more than you would just think if it was just like like an albatross. Um, and and we did in fact have to make a recommendation on if you have fishery closure, should they just be at one time or or not? And then that came into play. Okay, so a little bit more context. This is uh, uh, this is the slide that I had before I saw Chris's talk. Um, so uh, this is a hard slide to see. This is the distribution of income uh, spatially within South Africa. South Africa is you know one of the wealthier countries in Africa, um, and this is Mossel Bay, which is just over here. There's actually no colony here, but I have data. We have data for it. Uh, this is the annual income of people in this area. So I think there's some of the pelagic fishery factories around Mossel Bay. Um, so just quickly at the bottom here, low income, uh, about 40% in this area, medium, 50, uh, high income, uh, 13%. So what is high income in, in this region? Um, uh, my, so the, the numbers we're looking at here, look, look they're big numbers, right? They've got lots of zeros and things, uh, but a cup of coffee in uh, in US dollars would be 124, 124 rand. Um, so this is not a lot of coffee cups, right? Even even the sort of median level of uh, income uh, would be basically a graduate student stipend uh, at 50 percent high, um, and uh, where we call high income would be 35 thousand dollars. So that would be it's a that's less than a postdoc earns, right? You would be a high income earner. So cost, you know, and, and so there are a lot of people on the edge here. So the implications for fish for uh, conservation actions on communities is one of the things that is uh, of crucial importance here, particularly in some of these small ports. So um, uh, Hans by uh, Parton Oster, these plants here, they really are dependent. They're dependent on essentially tourism and and fishing. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about some science. Um, so one of the 
really interesting things about this problem was it, it cropped up about 2005 was when we started getting concerned. Um, and I was on a, a review panel um, and they said, well, should we close the areas for fishing? And we said, well, how the hell should we know? I mean, I don't know. What you should do is an experiment. Now, um, let's take an analogy. All remember stellar sea lions, right? We all did we did we ever work out whether anything affected stellar sea lions? Uh, could we have possibly done an experiment where we had some areas open and areas closed? And the answer is no, because it's illegal under the Endangered Species Act. You can't take an endangered species and play with it. But it turns out in South Africa you can. Um, uh, well, this was a good thing. This was a, well, sort of a good thing. Um, so what we ended up doing uh, was recommending, and they um, they implemented uh, a system where uh, they would take all colonies, ducks and robin, St. Croix and bird, draw twenty, a uh, nice, easy to implement twenty kilometer circle around the, the island, um, and essentially close it and open it using an experimental. Uh, design. So basically, in some years it's open, some years it's closed. I'll show you design in a moment. Um, the focus was on breeding success because you can actually see breeding success in the short term. Had we tried to use survival, the experiment would have taken decades. Um, so they they did they did this experiment, um, and in true scientific fashion, they couldn't reach any conclusions. Okay, uh, the only thing that they could reach agreement on, which was a little bizarre was when in doubt, set up a panel, right? And that's where this panel actually came to be. We were the, we were the only thing that conservation stakeholders, the communities, and the fishermen could agree on is essentially when the set up a committee, uh, the committee's gonna write a report and whatever we say, they're going to use. And if, if you if you thought I believe that, um, you're <laughs> living in a dream world. But anyway, um, we met uh, several times with stakeholders, um, didn't actually go to any ports, although Phil Tracton went to uh, uh, some of the, the, the factories and stuff. But most of the work was, was uh, uh, virtually and uh, at a hotel in, in Cape Town. Anyway, so what, what, what was this all about? So let's talk a little bit about the sort of key science. Um, the idea here was that um, you would set up the closest you can to a, a, a true uh, experiment. So we treated the two west colonies here, Dustin Island and Robin Island, as sort of a, a pair. And we treated St. Croix and Bird Island as a pair. Um, and the far to see diagram at the bottom here is essentially the way we did the experiment. So we would, uh, X means that we closed this, the, the area. Um, so we closed, or they closed, um, these colonies in parallel between the two islands within each group um, and for a number of years. And, and the number of years uh, was a trade-off because from a pure experimental design, you want on all, on all, on all, on all. Uh, but the argument was made that that actually could be disruptive to payments. So rather than, um, uh, rather than uh, in year on year off, we, we came up with blocks. Um, and and who, who knows how to farm? Okay, how tall is Anna Park? She's like, <laughs> okay, so we were in a meeting and this was day three of a different panel and the industry wanted um, on off on off for their experiment and the NGOs essentially wanted to close for M. Um, so neither of these were great experimental management. And Anna Palmer walked in the room and said, it's gonna be three years and we're not taking any comments on it. Thank you, it's all straight out. And we thought, I was on, I was on the panel, I thought, okay, now the, the bricks are gonna, they just accepted everything Anna said. So if you ever get into trouble, get Anna, she is, she is tough. Um, so uh, we closed these areas and then uh, collected uh, monitoring data from uh, all four colonies to the extent possible. Uh, so some things were relatively easy to collect. Uh, chick condition, just um, uh, uh, sort of a uh, 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 relative scale chick condition. Uh, they put uh, transducers on some of the, the adults to look at uh, foraging distance. Turned out to be more complicated than we ever thought. Uh, for the Western areas, uh, it was possible to estimate uh, chick survival, chick growth, and fledging success. Uh, so as, as variables, it was not possible to do that in the, in the Eastern colonies. 
Uh, one thing about these variables, of course, is that they're not uncorrelated, right? So fledging success and death surely have some relationship between them, right? If you are dead, you do not fledge. Um, so uh, one of the, the, the challenges here is to, uh, to avoid double counting uh, the, the measures. So what did we, uh, what was, how did the experiment actually work? And this was mainly work that ultimately was done by Anna, uh, was we fitted, we, we collected our data, we got an experimental treatment, um, and we fitted a range of uh, generalized linear mixed models to explore um, essentially uh, what the effect of a closure uh, on, um, uh, on reproductive parameters was. Now, that's an important step in this process. I said closure, right? Most people doing this kind of work would be looking at catch, right? So if you think about it, does this sound more logical? Uh, which should affect reproductive success? The amount of catch in an area or whether it's just open or closed? The catch seems like the right answer. Well, it's actually the wrong answer. And that is because what creates catch? What do you need to get captures? The fishing boats and fish. Fish. Okay, so what you find though is that we uh, breeding success is higher when catch is higher because catch is higher because the animals are there. So we ended up with using closure as our primary response, uh, our, our primary uh, independent variable. Um, we then developed models or laid about models that took changes in reproductive parameters and changed that into growth rate. Um, and then uh, because we had multiple models and we had all sorts of other things like that, we had to then basically integrate, you know, what, what, what does chick condition tell us versus chick survival versus foraging distance. So there was a, a way to essentially come up with an overall uh, conclusion that we could make some recommendations on. Um, this then led us into the delights of doing real experiments in the real world, okay? Um, the Western colonies were actually quite successful in terms of the implementation of the, um, uh, of the, of the experimental regime. Uh, the problem on the East, we just gave up eventually, uh, not to the happiness of everyone concerned, because the fishermen were unhappy that we ignored the data because they lost a whole lot of catch. And the state, the conservation stakeholders were really upset because we ignored all their monitoring data, uh, but that's what statistics tell you to do. Um, so what were the problems uh, with St. Croix and, and Bird? Well, Bird, um, no one bothered to come, even when they were open, right? So we had an area that was open to fishing, but fishermen didn't come. So there was essentially no treatment effect in, in the Bird area. St. Croix, uh, unfortunately St. Croix, and then you know St. Croix, you've been there. Uh, it's a difficult place to monitor, apparently. And so they were really unable to ca calculate the, the, the response variables that we were offered. So we, we had all these data, but we didn't end, end, end up using them. Yeah. Was there a lot of fishing there to begin with? I'm going to show you that right now. Um, so uh, this is actually um, the, look, let's forget that for the moment. Uh, these are the plots of the catches of anchovy and sardine uh, by, by area in terms of tons. Um, so you can see that, you know, when, when the West Coast tends to be an anchovy area, so when they're open, we're talking 20, 30,000 tons of, of anchovy. Um, the, the, one of the challenges that we discovered with uh, the East area, which I was going to raise here, is uh, O means closed, C, sorry, C means closed, O means open. Um, is there something interesting in this panel that you might want to highlight? Um, apparently, there was some failure to implement the closures quite as uh, well as we had expected. Uh, so one, another reason why we were concerned about using the east areas is we weren't really sure that they that they were really implemented the way we, we had. We definitely caught some people um, uh, some people are violating the closures. It was, it was one of those virtual meetings, you know, everyone's sitting and looking at screens, and there's somebody, you've all been to stock panels and things like that, right? You've all been to assessment reviews where someone puts up slide number one, slide number two, you know, there's another plot of a fit, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's just terribly boring. 
And I've seen hundreds and hundreds of these plots before, and most people have, but Tom has Tom often has never seen these plots. And so the biologist was putting out plot after plot of patch by location. And I can't completely know you know, it's like, get me through this, please. Of course, why are there little dots inside the circles? So the circles are closed, the dots are where the catches are. And that's an interesting question. <laughs> and no one had realized that. So that 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 was that was another one of those lessons that you learned. Plot your data and pay attention. Um, so uh, one of the challenges between um, uh, when analyzing these data are what are the data? Okay. So the way, and I'm not a penguin biologist, but the way these things work is the, the data tend to be individual, right? So you go to a nest, you get the condition of chick number five, you come back and you've got chick number five again, right? So there's, there's actually individual data. Um, the same is true of foraging distance and things like that. Um, the, the, what you can't do with data like that is just average it because, What's that famous word that I love to ask during general exams? Begins with a P. Right, the negative binomial? No! <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> Pseudo replication. So, the first analyses that were done of these data, which actually ended up being published, um, didn't take into account that you can't just average your data as if it were independent samples. You get, you get really strong effects because you, 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 um, misinterpret the variant structure. So there was a lot of work to develop essentially uh, either uh, assessment methods, and here's just an example of one of the linear models that we looked at, uh, was um, how do you group the data in such a way that you don't uh, overestimate the precision and hence uh, overestimate whether there's an effect. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all the, the algebra, uh, but it ended up with large numbers of uh, random effects models, uh, random effects on the actual individual penguin, but month effects, year effects, all sorts of stuff, um, as well as retractions, of, not retractions, corrections of papers that have been published when they found mistakes, and uh, non-converged models, and all sorts of good stuff. Um, here's one of those papers. Uh, you'll notice a couple of people that you should recognize as being people here on the faculty. Uh, this was one of the, the papers that analyzed the data. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the uh, models that we looked at, but you know these were just for the West area. These were just different uh, combinations and permutations of what response variable should we be using? Uh, should the data be aggregated, disaggregated? Fixed effects, random effects, um, that sort of thing. You, but you've got to, what we what we learned really quickly is you've got to be really careful about setting up your model correctly. Otherwise, you find significance where there really wasn't significance. Um, the other thing that came up um, and, and was something no one really thought about is these things here, these foraging variables. So. When you, when you put a uh, recorder on a um, penguin and you record how long it is it at sea, what matters? Okay, so the, the types of things that we looked at were maximum foraging distance. So basically how far out did the penguin go from the colony? Uh, what was the path length? You know, where did it, you know, what was the total length of it? Um, and just how long was it? So those are the three variables and they are not, they are not very well correlated. Right, so they are not measuring the same thing, um, and ultimately, it was a real struggle to then link these to reproductive success, other than in a very qualitative way. And we were told we had to be quantitative. So, if the path length doubles, what happens to the uh, reproductive output of the penguin? Anyone want to put up their hand? We couldn't, so we got rid of it. Um, we were getting less and less popular as this was going on. Okay. Yeah. Is it is it the chicks or the adults that go out and forage? Uh, yeah. the adults. Just the adults. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're, 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 once they fledge, they they go out. But they're not pretty chicks. Yeah. Uh, how uh, that monitor is basically have a tag or spike yeah. that is on the penguin, and see if the signal like being attacked and having a tag on a penguin on changing the behavior by like weight or by signature. Uh, by definition, no, because the only way you find out is by putting a tag on a penguin. Um, 
Uh, and that we talked about, but no one seemed to be too as concerned as you might think. The bigger issue was that these tags tell you where the penguin was, not what it was doing, right? So what you're really interested in is where was the penguin foraging, not where was the penguin going? Um, and there's a lot of these models are fit using kernel density estimators. And from what we can work out, most of the kernel, there's no fish. That's just where, the, if you're a penguin, you have to leave the colony, right? And so by definition, there's a lot of pings near the colony because you've got, you've got to be there. So um, the issue is more, what, what, what were the data telling us in that regard? But undoubtedly, if you're not someone who tags, and all these people tag penguins, so no one is willing to go down that road. Okay, so um, uh, to put it mildly, this issue of aggregated versus disaggregated became a, became a bit of a fun fight between the various analysts, and there are technical appendices to IC's papers that no one will ever read ever again. Uh, but once we, we basically took these groups and said, look guys, we are the panel, and you are gonna do what we tell you. Right? No, 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 our model is better. No, if you wanna play this game, you gotta to listen to Anna. Um, and so we forced them to apply the same models to the same data. So previously, group A was applying models A, B, and C, and group B, D, and F, and got different answers, of course. And so we forced them to, um, to uh, analyze the data using the same models, um, and lo and behold, if you do things consistently, uh, you get consistent answers. So uh, we got rid of that problem, much to the disgust of both groups, but they, bet, they both thought they were the best. Um, the, 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 the way that these people have been interpreting changes in um, population here is that uh, a 1% change in the population growth was considered to be something you might pay attention to. Now, just for context, the population is dropping at 5% per annum. Okay, so a 1% change in the population growth rate was considered important, but of course, uh, I've lost, I heard 1% is less than 5%. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what you've got here is a negative value is a, a meaningful uh, effect. Uh, the green uh, lines here are essentially one, uh, estimates of uh, various variables that um, uh, essentially were suggesting there is a positive effect of closures on reproductive parameters. The dotted line is the 1% threshold. So most of these effects were somewhere between half and, and 1%, if they were positive at all. Uh, the other thing that we found was some of the other parameters were all over the place, like chick condition and the foraging distance stuff just didn't give us anything anything useful. Yeah, Andre? Yeah. Did the, the translation between the uh, chick condition or yep. fledging to population growth rate, is this some left of which? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, same through. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and generally those are not particularly sensitive to the success they really decided. So is that uh, part of the deal? Well, yeah, the effect on the reproductive exactly. parameters was the pretty small. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was that was sort of how we did it because that's yeah. the only thing we can show. I'll talk a little bit about survival later on. Um, so our eventual conclusion um, uh, was that from a uh, reproductive parameter point of view, the, the effect of the closures is about uh, 0.7 to 1.5 percent on the population growth rate, um, and uh, and this ended up in the newspaper. Of course, you know these are pretty damn small compared to 5 percent. So whatever is going on isn't just fishing around uh, colonies affecting the island closures. Um, so, uh, and the other thing that we couldn't quantify because we just didn't have the data is, was there any benefit to adult survival and immature survival through whatever process? And, and uh, it was probably positive, but probably even smaller than that. So overall, the conclusion of this panel, and I'll follow up in a couple of other dimensions as well, is yes, there is an effect. No, it is small. Okay, so. That's part one of what we had to do. But we had an economist. You have to have something to do with an economy. You can't just like foraging distances and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, Terence, you need to pay attention here. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what the, the, the other side of it was, you know, yes, there's a benefit. If this was the US, it's an endangered species, we would close those areas, right? 
But I did indicate that these are fishing areas and there are some significant effects on people. So the fishing industry developed what they called an opportunity-based model. And the idea here was to say, if you close an area, what would happen to the catch? Okay. Now, most of us are familiar with the fishery that um, uh, Chris talked about last night, the ground fish fishery, right? And I kind of think this is what a ground fisherman will say, but if you talk to uh, someone who uses a pelagic trawl to catch sardines, they will say that all the dopes use trawls because all you have to do is stick the damn thing on the, on the ground in the right place and you'll find some fish, right? Um, I don't think ground fish fishermen always would agree with that. Uh, but when you're trying to find pelagic fish, they tend to be aggregated, and those aggregations are moving around. So you can't just go back to the same a spot just down the road and find fish. Finding fish is a, a process involving um, uh, observations at sea, communication amongst fishermen. Uh, they'll often go out and get nothing. Uh, so there is a, a definite uh, possibility of, of loss of catch. So they built a model. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I'm going to go through the whole model. Uh, the idea was here is the, the dots that you see, there's blue, red, and green dots. These are actual um, sets for, uh, I guess this would be anchovy, um, on the West Coast uh, in on this particular day. So this is the 6th of September, 2013. Uh, there are six, seven areas, seven areas here. Um, and you can see on this particular day, now this is before there are any closures, so this is an open situation. Uh, you can see that almost all of the catches were in the little circle. Okay, so if I close the circle, where would those catches go? Okay. Uh, the argument made by the industry is essentially the place they would go is where somebody found uh, fish on that day, uh, or maybe the previous day. And in this case, there's only one of these little guys here. So if you're a fisherman, you can't go here, you would probably go there, right? Um, and so uh, the difficulty is that not all of these guys can go fish in that pile because you run into accidents. Um, and so they, they come up with a, a method to essentially attribute um, uh, sort of how much of the, the catch would be lost. Um, and so you've got a variety of situations. These are hypothetical. Um, so here's a situation. Uh, you're going to have to see the test during this seminar. Uh, here, all the catches are inside the closed area. Where can you go? You can go nowhere. So according to this model, the fishermen couldn't afford anything on that day. Um, in this case, uh, this is the same one you had before. Uh, most of the catches are in the closed area. Uh, there was some, uh, there was a setup here in St. Helena Bay, and some of the, some of this catch could be replaced, but essentially most of it would be lost. This gets you to the point that for many of these sets, they are in the closures because that's where the fish happen to be. So um, uh, we, the, the, the model is obviously quite complicated. Uh, we reviewed that model, um, and it came up with some pretty large um effect so um i'm not going to go through all of these but um essentially these are different closer closure regimes uh this is the one proposed by the ngos which i'm going to call mida7 which basically says if i've seen a penguin there i'm going to close it uh, and this was the government lab um, uh, biologists essentially the uh with, with help from the industry who basically had really small closures uh, but uh, essentially, according to this model, you'd be losing at least 10 to 15 percent of the catch as being un, uh, unreplaceable, basically, um, and with uncertainty going way, way up. Um, we weren't terribly convinced by this uh, and in fact suggested a brand of utility model. Um, um, so, uh, but this was this was a, a major argument by the industry that you know if we if we close these areas, the, there's going to be essentially no impact on penguins, but there's going to be a huge impact on people. Um, and our overall conclusion was, yeah, good idea, probably true in a qualitative direction, but quantitatively, I'm not going to buy this. So uh, we sent them away to do more work. 
Uh, I'm going to definitely not get into this, but um, uh, uh, there was what's called an input output model. Uh, so this is a model that basically says, um, you, you, I'm sure you've heard this from uh, any, any public presentation on impact. Like if we reduce the catch of widow rockfish in Port Angeles, uh, what's going to happen? Well, like the fishermen aren't going to be fishing, and so the tackle shop's going to close. The tackle guy buys his his petrol from the gas stations. The gas station's going to go bankrupt. That'll wipe out the the, the, the pub. You can see the sort of the, 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 so the, the, that's what these models do. Hopefully, a little bit more rigorously than I just described. Um, and essentially, this was a model developed for the um, for the West Coast. Uh, it implied. Uh, losses in jobs of in the thousands uh, if these implement uh, uh, if these results were implemented. Uh, I didn't review this. This was Jim, Jim's work, uh, but again, we 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 concluded that, that these sort of approaches tend to overestimate the effect of uh, uh, the negative effects on the economy. So, um, so overall, uh, what did we say? Uh, we said yes. Uh, closures will have a negative impact on the industry and local communities, uh, but none of the analyses that we had were convincing, right? So don't do it again. Um, and more importantly, a lot of this work didn't take into account the, the regional effect. So we saw that last night in, in, um, uh, in, in, in Chris's presentation. Can anyone remember which, which small Alaskan town will be most impacted in the harvesting sector? Can anyone remember what the small town that had the largest impact was? It's called Seattle, right? Do you remember the eight that we saw on the slide last night? Um, the same sort of applies here is that where, where are the fishing companies based? Are they based in small towns? No, they're in Cape Town. Is Cape Town that affected by fishing? No. So the local side of things really needed to be done a lot better. Um, I'm not going to get into this in a big way, but just wanted to mention one of the things that we um, uh, that we were concerned about was if you're going to close an area, how do you decide what the area that you close is? Now, um, we had everything from uh, essentially this thing, which is the foraging range. Uh, if you close the entire foraging range, you would pretty much close the whole fishery because it's anyway you done penguin. Um, and then you had other people, including my ex PhD supervisor, who eventually draw through the smallest circle around the island you could possibly draw. Um, ultimately, we uh, recommended that none of the method, none of the data sets that they had were adequate, and they really need to start collecting data using time depth recorders to essentially see not where the penguin was, but was the penguin actually foraging. So it's not just these the areas that we had data on are really presence uh, of penguins, not where penguins actually find fish. So uh, we did end up with a recommendation on, on how to move forward, but um, more work needed. Okay, so the, 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 one of the final things that we had, we were told to look at was how to uh, trade things off. Because ultimately the Minister of Fisheries is gonna make a decision, right? And she needs to decide, um, you know, what's the, what's how many dollars per penguin or how many jobs per penguin? So if you want 10 more penguins, you're going to lose 50 jobs. Okay. Oh, and just to say that uh, this is your algebra at the time. Um, we've got 10,000, well, no, we've got 5,000 penguins. Okay. How many penguins are we actually talking about per year? If it's at half a percent per annum. That's not a lot of penguins. You're talking small numbers of penguins and lots of voters. Okay, so the, the minister really wanted to know uh, how do we trade things off. So we, we, we spent some time looking at that. Um, and sort of the main things that really came out were that none of the economic analyses were robust enough to, to form the basis for, for that trade off analysis. So what we ended up looking at was uh, something we felt a little bit more comfortable with. Uh, which is the relationship between the area closed uh, and the one of the metrics of, of lost catch. Um, and it, what, what we found um, was that that relationship depended on a bunch of things. It depended particularly on the area that you're working. 
So um, Dyer Island, um, remember that was the one that we didn't have a closure on, it was on the south coast. Uh, that is the, the blue here. Um, and you can see that it, the numbers on the y-axis are a lot higher for Dyer Island. Essentially, closures in Dyer Island, for better or worse, are going to be difficult to reproduce. They just not, there's nowhere to go in that area. I don't know the Dyer Island area that well, do you? Um, used to drive past it, but that's about it. Um, so Dyer Island is a problem. The other thing that we found was that depending on how you place the closure, with a more sort of uh, strategic approach to putting closures in, closing some areas rather than just putting circles, uh, you can actually get some quite uh, differences in, in efficiency. Uh, going back to, was it Bill, your point about uh, closures, uh, we, we concluded that there's, you know, essentially the, they should be year-round closures because there's things going on in those areas all year-round. And we, we had no, no basis to say to uh, do something different. Okay, um, I'm not going to get into this. We basically said, take, you, the, you put them in, don't ever, so these people hate each other. The biologists of the different side, they really hate each other. You didn't want to turn off the lights because they're a pure biologist by the end of You know some of them. You know what I'm talking about. They're yeah, quite passionate. Um, so we're fishery biologists. Fishery biologists tend to be far more relaxed about the animals than penguin biologists and turtle biologists. They're quite passionate. Um, so we basically said, what you need to do is implement these, implement closures if you want them, and leave them alone for six to ten years, and hopefully by then all the panel have retired and moved on to other things and don't get off or what they're doing. But monitor. Um, so the other thing that cropped up was um, we've used the experiments to essentially tell us what the effect of fishing on penguin reproductive successes, right? How are we going to know whether our closures are successful if we just close things? Right? Because we don't, well, you, you've got no backy experiment because you've just backied yourself out of the, the door because you closed it. And so one of the things we, uh, we, we, we gave recommendations on was if you're going to implement closures in the future and you want to understand what those closures actually do, you need to think about how you use the closures in an experimental sense going forward. Um, so that was that was an interesting topic that came up. Okay, so nearing the end, what's the time? I have no idea. Yeah, 90 minutes. 90 minutes? Nine. Oh, <laughs> you sure it's not 90? <laughs> um, okay, so I won't go through too much of this detail. So one of the things that we definitely learned as we went through this was uh, the, there's a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, I'm not going to go through this one because I don't understand fit tags and telemetry methods. And there was a whole bunch of recommendations. And Emily, don't you want to sponsor an African um, African penguin so we can afford a couple more fit, fit, uh, trans, fit tags so we can see what these things are doing? Um, uh, so there's, there's definitely areas to improve uh, understanding of, you know, where are the penguins going? What are they doing when they go there? Are they actually putting on weight when they come back to the, the colonies, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I already talked a little bit about this. Uh, basically, you need to do much more work on the uh, economic uh, effects of uh, fishing. Uh, we didn't like that model that basically said if you didn't do any fishing, there's no other fish, the, the fish just don't exist. Uh, and Terence, random utility models. Um, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, mice model. So that was the other thing. So who knows what a mice model is? Yay! Oh, okay. Uh, Eva Pagani was on the panel, so they had to be mice models. So mice models are the, the term mice is models of intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessment. Essentially, these are small tactical ecosystem models that are tailored to specific problems. Um, and so we recommended that they, in addition to doing all the monitoring work, that they actually do that too. Um, and then uh, we, they also need to start thinking about what this will mean for their management system. So if they start changing where surveys and where fishing occurs, is that going to affect the management system that they've got in place? Okay, um, so final comments. This was, this was actually one of the slides I did give to the minister. Um, you can read it, it reads so politically nice. Considerable effort has been made by the fishing and conservation sector in collaboration with government to understand the causes of the decline. Da, 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 da. 
ICE's beat, this is the experiment, identifies the best practices for assessing forage fishing. Continued for, oh, we don't have to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, that's the minister. Um, one of the interesting things we discovered during the panel was that the minister's house is in Boulder. <laughs> she literally sent penguins outside her doors, um, which where I come from seems like a conflict of interest. <laughs> but um, so uh, I gave this presentation to the, um, the public in, in South Africa, mainly the press. Um, and uh, she'd obviously seen the report. I'm not going to read all of it, but basically, uh, her decision was uh, I'm going to close uh, essentially. Uh, 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 closed areas around every single colony starting that very day uh, for a minimum of six years to be reviewed uh, after, uh, sorry, 10 years to be reviewed after six years. Um, the, uh, during the panel, um, I needed coffee, so I used the old tactic of when in doubt, if you can't get anywhere, put the people you don't like into a room and turn off the lights, sort of thing. So what I did was I said to the stakeholders from various groups, I'm going to give you half an hour. Because uh, I think they're going to be flooded. And if you don't agree yourselves, you're going to have to suffer the wound of the minister. Right? That's the sort of damage, which is, Tim, are you going to negotiate with Brunel and maybe get what you want? Or are you going to trust me to draw a circle on the map? I'm bigger. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> We did not go down the road of violence <laughs> that I remember. Um, you switched off the lights, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the lights were definitely on. Well, um, take tactics on negotiation. <laughs> uh, we will not be having South African uh, negotiation. <laughs> um, so for, for about half an hour, I sent them into a room to negotiate what closures would be if they if they were going to be closed, they actually agreed on four out of the six areas, um, and then the the minister sort of picked that up and, and said, if there's agreement between the parties, that's what the um, uh, what that's what will be done. Otherwise, we're just going to draw twenty kilometers around the islands. I thought that was a really good idea. Because normally, what you say is, let's have a long process to discuss the issues, or so you never get anything done. Um, so there's the minister. The next day, uh, we had uh, all sorts of news, uh, not as much as Cody Suswalski's where the billions of snow crab gone, but you know, you can't win them all. Um, uh, and the final slide was an email by the, uh, the, the guy who was running the process the day after the panel. Dear panel, that went well. I'll let you know if and when the letters and intent to start legal proceedings come through. <laughs> and with that, I will stop. At least the 15 minutes before lightning, they took us out to dinner uh, when I was down there in Cape Town the last two months ago. <laughs> but very even too. Yeah. Did, did the period of steep decline in the population coincide with any of the going down in the fishery? Uh, not in the fishery per se, but certainly in the fish. So the, the sardine had uh, re collapsed, I guess is the way I put it. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's the story is too good uh, when you just look at that figure because the figure that figure is the entire coast and if you plot the coast against the sardine you get the plot that i showed you right at the beginning with the survival rate thing mm -hmm. but what we forced them to do is disaggregate everything spatial and then it all falls apart so what's actually happened to sardine on, on in south africa is the damn stupid fish have moved from the west coast to the south coast so in fact, on the south coast, there's actually for a while there was a big increase in in sardine because they had moved from the west coast. Okay. And it didn't doesn't match up very well at all with the with the penguin uh, dynamics. The only you know the one thing that that certainly fits rather well is the sea lion increase and the decline, but then you can't explain why they increase. Um, so yeah, there's you know there's no I think that one thing we're convinced of is there's no single smoking gun. There's not one factor that's right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say anybody that's looking at the two other things, the one being other seabird populations because they must be doing the same. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the gannets are the, the one that looks very they, they occupy the same area and they're in the same area, yep. the same stomach. And, and following on from that, if you track the gannets, what I am sort of getting at is that there's a lot of 
um, that not all years, all sardines and all anchovies are equal, um, particularly with harmful algal weeds that's coming to to the area. Um, I think it was in 2015 around there when there was this massive harmful algal weed, the condition of particularly anchovies declined entirely and things like um, Gannets had to fly instead of 100 or 200 kilometers before it had to fly to Cape Town for 800 kilometers because the condition of the fish that they were foraging on was so poor. So that's got nothing to do with the fishery. Sure. And um, there are so many other variables that are. Uh, Th this the quality is, of the fish and the quality yeah. of the fish. Firstly, you're, you're spot on. Uh, second, we tended to focus on things that could exhibit trend. So there's a lot of things that are shock effects, like cabs in particular years can affect reproductive success in that year, but that won't explain the big trend. You've got to have something going on continuously. So our focus really was on, on things that are continuously going on and impacting the population. Um, and yes, I mean, again, just focusing that there's almost certainly multiple stresses that are in play. Um, and, you know, the, the, I guess one of the things that we really focused on was um, the inverse of NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. So the NIMBY in this case is I can see fishermen with fish, catching fish where the penguins are. So they're sort of, the, they're, 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 the conservation groups aren't anti-fishing per se, they, but it's so obvious that, you know, penguins eat fish, fishermen catch fish, right? So the, one of the, the things the panel really had focused on was making people think beyond just fishing, which is why we emphasize, you know, 1% is less than 5% that, you know, yes, this is something you can see and you can quantify, but that doesn't mean that the, the other things are actually not more important. Yep. How do the sardines and anchovies manage? Like, is there a tack? Yep. There's like an ecosystem consideration? Considerations as such. They've okay. got a pretty, they, it's, it's a tack-based system. Uh, they do acoustics and it's a proportion of the acoustics. Um, in fact, you heard about it in 558. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the the difference from most fisheries regimes is the target biomass is about 70% of unfish. So they don't, they don't try to do anything fancy ecosystem-wise, but by having a, a fairly high target biomass, that's sort of good enough for government work. Gotcha. But what they don't do is there's no direct link between, uh, you know, apart from east-west, there's no sort of spatial management in the fishery. Mm -hmm. Under okay. Yes. So I have two questions. First question is what, what is the flexibility of penguins to choose the colony? So for example, if you have a closure on third island, are we going to hold on a little some boy? And mm -hmm. the second question was it talked about the value of job losses in the fishery depending on the closure. What's the value of job gains to the tourism? Okay, so uh, both of those are really good questions. Um, uh, the first one, there is definitely movement of penguins between colonies. Um, and, uh, you know, that has made, for example, modeling the West Coast a little challenging because some of the animals and ducks have moved to Robin. So the decline in ducks at Robin can be attributed to an increase at, at Robin. Uh, quantifying the amount of movement and when it occurs in life cycle, that's still a real challenge. It, it definitely happens that penguins move colonies. In theory, they're not supposed to, that's not that's not the sort of story, but they definitely do. Um, the, um, the the tourism thing is is interesting. Um, and that is uh yeah, Chris is great talking today. But th that is fine as long as you ignore allocation, right? Because the people who lose their jobs are not going to go into tourism. Okay. So where is all tourism for penguins? It's in Cape Town, right? I hate to say it, but no one is going to Dyer Island, which is in the middle of bloody nowhere, to go and look at a penguin when you can go to Cape Town, right? So um, th that was the other thing we actually had to, you actually got it right in the way you expressed this. Um, people kept emphasizing how valuable tourism was without recognizing what's important is not how valuable it is, but what would tourism increase if there were closures? So what, what is the impact on change in, in tourism? And the, as far as we were told, and you know, we didn't, this wasn't focused, 
it, there's no direct link between how many penguins there are and whether Tim wants to take photographs and buy plastic penguins and sticky penguins and you know have a beer with a penguin on it. Um, there is no there is no evidence that the, the number of penguins changes people's um, tourism like this. Where are they? Um, and did I get to see them? And in fact, they quoted uh, the boldest colony out there. There's a limit on how many they can go in. And that's because of the size. And I, I just don't see anyone going to Bird Island to go and watch penguins because it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know. So, so I, th th that argument was made. People just extrapolated Cape Town up to billions of penguins and said, no, no, that, that doesn't work. So it's, a, it's an important issue. It definitely came up, but not. It's just, you know, it, it's, an over, it's overemphasized. And of course, if you're a fisherman in some small town, it doesn't help you that there's tourism somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming your answer is going to be no, given that it's not on the issue of the hypothesis. But with a population of 5,000 penguins, does size have a consideration? Like, are penguins caught in fishing gear? Uh, there are reports of some being caught, but it's a very, very small uh, proportion. Um, and I think that's just because when the fishery operates relative to when part of the payments part, they're not, there's not, there's a temporal, there's a temporal difference. Yeah. How likely do you think that there will be a proposal for culling Cape Fur Seal? Uh, that was my first job, part of my first job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everyone, no one likes Cape Fur Seal. You literally can't, if they're seen on the economy, they will be sure. Um, and they, you, you, I don't know if the, the biologist, the seal biologist was shooting quite, I mean, in his 50s, and he's got a very small one, right? But yeah, you, you definitely, have, I mean, the the evidence is, and I think this is Dyer and so on, I'm not sure, that there are some specific animals that invade the colonies that, and this is true of the other seabirds as well, um, you know, and, and prey on, on penguins. And if they are seen, they are lethally wounded. But you know, so it's it, and, and it was a small number. But it, if you're if you're if you're a penguin eating seal, you can eat a few. I, I don't know what penguin sushi tastes like. <laughs> like ask a person. Uh, but yeah, they, and there's always a uh, request for the of the seal, but that's unrelated to penguins. Okay. Are we going to close the, some of these areas again? Yeah, close. But I mean, it sounds like a neg negligible effect. In terms of recovery of the population, especially the other factors like oil monitoring and shipping yep. and um, whatever else is happening. So the real politic um, is it is an international issue, and South Africa pays attention to the, the politics. Um, the industry were not as unhappy as I thought they would be, which probably does mean that the economic model was probably overestimating the effect. Um, as I say, the industry guys still took us out to dinner, so you know, they can't be all that bad. Um, uh, the worry for me is that by closing things, they're going to start not paying attention to the other things. That's my biggest worry is that we have done something, so we don't need to look in any other places. And that, to my mind, is the bigger worry. Um, I, I, I expected, to be honest, I expected her to close some of the colonies. But she went a lot further than I think anyone on the panel, including the people who are sort of nominated by the, the, the conservation NGOs, expected. None of us thought she'd just go, we're going to close everything, or bits of everything. But yeah, politics, definitely local politics coming in. All right, I think we ran out of time. Thank you, everyone, for coming to QuantSav. Thanks again to Andre. And please come to next week's talk by Yunzo Li uh, from Stony Brook University talking about social ecological systems and fisheries in China. That's it. Hey. Maddie and I would love to be here, but we are going to be in Anchorage talking about